My name is Doug Pierce. I'm the Dean of Arts at the University of Waterloo, and it's my great pleasure tonight to invite you on this warm, balmy evening to discuss a very cheerful topic, the Doomsday Clock. Uh, I should add, for those of you who don't know me, my nickname is Eeyore on campus, and I seem to be, I seem, <laughs> I seem to be bearing that out very well tonight. Um, I'd like to, first of all, on behalf of the University of Waterloo and Kitchener Public Library, acknowledge that we are in the traditional territory of the neutral, Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. The University of Waterloo and much of Kitchener Waterloo is situated in the Haldeman Tracks, the land promised to the Six Nations that includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. I would also like to extend my sincere thanks to Kitchener Public Library. They've been great partners over the course of this series. We've been running these events and having great turnout and it's a wonderful way for us to engage in a wider discussion with the, with the wider community, which we are delighted to be part of. Now, the Doomsday Clock is a widely indi recognized indicator of global threats extending from nuclear weapons to climate change and disruptive technologies. As a student in the 1980s, living in the UK, I was acutely conscious of the threat of nuclear war and annihilation. Cruise missiles, SS-20 missiles, Graham, uh, Greenham Common protests, all of these are part of my daily life in the 1980s as we seem to live under the threat of nuclear annihilation. In 1989, that threat, and with it, the clock that seemed to summarize every year for us, our very precarious predicament, seemed to fade from view. With the coming down of the Berlin Wall, many of us seemed to think that the days of possible nuclear annihilation were behind us. Recently, however, Concerns over the future of humankind have resurfaced, taken many different forms, and awoken new and old fears. In 2018, and again just last week, the Society of Atomic Scientists set the metaphoric doomsday clock to two minutes to midnight, the closest it has been to global catas catastrophe since the height of the Cold War. And in their 2019 statement, the scientists called this level of threat, quote, the new abnormal. Tonight, my colleagues will share their own insights on three areas of the threat identified by those scientists. Each will present their paper or their presentation separately. And at the end, I'll moderate a discussion where we'll invite you to join us as we explore these various areas. And I would ask you to hold your questions until the end when I'll try and get, fit in as many questions as possible before we wrap up this evening's presentation around 8.45. Our first speaker is Professor Alexander Lenoshka, Professor of Political Science specializing in international relations. His research encompasses international security, alliance politics, and theories of war. His most recent book is titled Atomic Assurance, the Alliance Politics of Nuclear Prolifer Proliferation. Alexander. Thank you very much. Where did the clicker go? Oh, here it is. <laughs> Thank you very much for that warm introduction, uh, Dean Pierce. I'll be speaking about nuclear weapons today, and so I want to begin with uh, something that's probably going to be on a lot of your minds right now as I deliver this talk, and that is, of course, President of the United States, Donald J. Donald J., um, J. Trump. And you might recall that back in November 2016, he famously declared, let it be an arms race. And certainly, over the course of 2017, he's issued a number of provocative statements to the effect of unleashing fire and fury against North Korea, that his button was bigger than other people's buttons. And indeed, it seems like his administration has been embarking upon a fairly vast and expensive nuclear weapon, weapons modernization program. And so that is the context in which we see the doomsday clock move ever closer towards midnight. Indeed, when he, shortly after he was elected, the clock moved two and a half minutes to midnight. And ever since, it's been more or less stuck at two minutes, presumably because here is an individual who seems to be unhinged, who, whose mental fitness is questionable, who seems to be a maverick with respect to how he thinks about nuclear weapons, that nuclear weapons are useful for 
great power coercion or other aspects of great power competition, that this is a new era in international politics of the sort that we have not yet seen before. And it's an era that is uh, filled with peril. But are we really in a dangerous new era? Seems to be the case, if you take seriously the doomsday clock, we seem to be stuck at um, two minutes to midnight. But is this really the case? And so what I would submit is that we should think a little carefully about the role of nuclear weapons and how Don J. Trump fits into our notions of how nuclear weapons affect international politics. And I think the picture that emerges will be a bit more murkier than some of you might think right now. An important caveat needs to be mentioned at the outset. The first is that technology, the technology behind nuclear weapons is well understood. There was, in fact, a student at Princeton University who published, or rather uh, written, an honors thesis about how to develop a nuclear weapon. The FBI subsequently came to campus and classified that honors thesis to this day. So you can do it if you're savvy enough and clever enough. However, as much as we understand the technology behind these weapons of awesome destructive potential, we do not really understand how nuclear weapons have affected international politics. They've only been used twice, after all, in 1945 over Hiroshima and Nagasaki, never since. We have a number of states with nuclear weapons arsenals that vary in size, but thankfully, they've not used them, not in war at least. And so lots of concepts like nuclear deterrence, the idea that you can use nuclear weapons to forestall or prevent large-scale aggression, is very hard to prove. You just don't have any positive cases or any negative cases, cases of failure or success, uh, that are clear-cut and so uh, can help build confidence in that theory. Trust me, I wrote a book on this subject, and I would uh, be hard-pressed to tell you with much confidence how nuclear weapons have really affected uh, politics, certainly alliance politics, but more broadly, international politics. We have to be careful about how we think about nuclear weapons changing various things that we care about. For one, nuclear weapons do not make wars more destructive. Which of these photos is Hiroshima, and which of these is Tokyo? Very good. Very good. And the only reason I can tell is that there are hills and mountains in the background. But otherwise, the sheer scale of destruction is more or less um, parallel. The other visual cues just relate to those who might uh, understand the local geography. But it's very difficult to tell. Now, for another, nuclear weapons not necessarily create the ability to annihilate. A favorite story that I like to tell when I, I teach nuclear weapons to my undergraduate students is the story of the Cartaginian peace. So this was in the aftermath of the three Punic Wars fought between the city of Carthage and the city of Rome many, many, many years ago. And the settlement, so to speak, of those wars was as follows that the Romans, because they were able to uh, be triumphant in those uh, wars, were able to impose a very punitive peace. So much so that they killed all the men, they sold the women and children to slavery, and to top it all off, they uh, sowed the earth with salt, such that nothing could grow ever again on that piece of territory in which Carthage was located. So the ability to annihilate is not necessarily new. It's actually quite old. So what did change? There are at least a several such things. The first concerns speed. We can now destroy and annihilate one another within minutes, which means that leaders must make momentous, civilization-significant uh, decisions within the matter of minutes. The sequence has also changed with respect to how states might fight wars. If you want to hurt a civilian population, before 1945, you have to go through the military first. The military was that barrier. You have to beat that military in order to hurt the enemy, so to speak. Now, nuclear weapons reverses that equation. You can now impose lots of pain because you can simply fly bombers or lob cruise missiles that are nuclear tipped, going around military uh, forces and hit civilian targets with that awesome destructive potential that nuclear weapons are capable of wreaking. 
And that means that the essence of statecraft, or what we call in my field of international relations, coercive diplomacy, the ability to hurt and get good deals out of that ability, has, a, has shifted dramatically. Before the nuclear era, the side that's able to inflict the most pain had the upper hand. But now, everyone in the age of nuclear weapons is vulnerable because one country with nuclear weapons can hold the population hostage, even if that target country has nuclear weapons of its own right. So instead of the uh, bargaining power that you might have being a function of your ability to inflict the most pain, now your bargaining power is drawn from the ability to absorb as much pain. And if you can absorb the most pain, then you're the one with an upper hand. And so, the nature of war presumably has changed by extension. And this is more or less what we mean by the nuclear revolution, at least in international relations scholarship. That war used to be a contest of strength. That bargaining power that countries have is drawn from the ability to inflict harm. Now, it's a matter of risk-taking, of being a good brinksman where you can push the envelope, but you never really go over it. And your willingness to push that envelope is the what determines how much bargaining power, how, how well you would succeed in extracting a favorable settlement in whatever you're trying to negotiate. And of course, there's a risk here, because even if you try to undertake small, limited wars to push that envelope, it could escalate into large nuclear wars. This is, in a nutshell, the idea of mutually assured destruction. Mutually assured destruction holds that if two, nuclear, if two adversaries have nuclear weapons, then both can use them against each other. And if they have the ability to not only respond, or to, um, absorb a nuclear weapon strike, but also unleash one of their own, then they should understand, if they're rational, that the game is not worth the candle that it no, makes no sense to engage in any sort of armed hostilities because of this risk. As such, and uh, paradoxically, this is a stable world. If there are two countries with vast nuclear weapons arsenals, countries capable of absorbing a nuclear strike and issuing one in response, then they should backwards induce and understand that anything uh, above a certain threshold of violence is um, not worth it. And so, it's actually uh, an inducement to negotiate and to uh, cooperate with another side. It's a stable world. It's a condition because this is not the result of any policy. This is a matter of facing this hard structural constraint of nuclear war being in the shadows. Now, the person who conceived of mutually assured destruction as having this revolutionary impact on international politics basically distilled these ideas in a book called The Meaning of the Nuclear Revolution. It's a good book. It's one that very much informed the way I think about nuclear weapons. The problem is that he wrote another book, in fact, earlier the same decade, called The Logic of American Nuclear Strategy. What's going on? There is this nuclear revolution that... Um, has this pacifying effect in international politics, then why is the United States not really abiding by its tenets? More to the point, if losers can destroy victors, then why is the United States preparing for nuclear war? That seems illogical. That's the very illogic that Robert Jervis was alluding to. Why deploy small nuclear weapons like the Davy Crockett, which if used in the battlefield as it was supposed to be used, should war break out in Germany in the 1960s, that guy would have died in the bomb, within the bomb yield. Why deploy these sorts of weapons? Why develop nuclear weapons aimed at another country's nuclear weapons, what we call counterforce nuclear weapons? This is a multiple independent re-entry vehicle, excuse the jargon, we are talking about nuclear weapons, whereby a single missile has multiple warheads that could be uh, trained at various targets, which could uh, help 
uh, provide the state with those capabilities to presumably have a disarming first strike, meaning deprive that target of having a second strike capability, which would go on to ensure mutually assured destruction. Why invest in these sorts of weapons? And why invest in missile defense? This was the Star Wars a project of the Reagan administration in the 1980s, Strategic Defense Initiative. Indeed, just last week, the Trump administration unveiled its own missile defense initiative. Missile defense is very expensive, and the technology is not quite developed. But why invest in missile defense, given those short odds, and given how pacific the nuclear revolution ought to be making great power relations? But it's not just the United States. I don't want to suggest here that the United States is uniquely unhinged in going about international politics. We are familiar with the story of the Cuban Missile Crisis. I don't want to rehearse the history here. But suffice it to say, the Soviets introduced, for various reasons, nuclear-tipped missiles in Cuba. There was some negotiation, some brinkmanship. The Soviets ultimately relented to trade off uh, uh, the United States from, to remove its own nuclear missiles in Turkey. And it seems like that was a hunky-dory moment in international politics because everyone realized the dangers of nuclear war and how strategic competition of this sort um, should be contained. What is interesting is that the takeaway that the Soviets had from the Cuban Missile Crisis is that they backed down to John F. Kennedy and the other Americans in the Canadian administration, precisely because they did not have a sufficient number of nuclear weapons. That the nuclear balance, so to speak, was totally against uh, their, um, uh, them, that was in favor of the United States. That is why they ramped up, in part, their nuclear weapons production. They thought they lost the Cuban Missile Crisis because they did not have enough nukes. But really, should that be the case, considering the logic of the nuclear revolution? So to summarize, our best theory in international politics states that you know, nuclear weapons should have this specific effect on great power relations. But unfortunately, the evidence does not square with it. States still devise war plans that involve nuclear weapons. Recall the Davy Crockett in West Germany that the United States Army deployed. States do think that mutually assured destruction is a policy, not a condition, and that, that the United States is trying to get out of mutually assured destruction, and that the Cuban Missile Crisis and its aftermath reveal that states do care about the balance of nuclear capabilities, even when they have second strike capabilities. Second strike capabilities uh, that exist precisely because they have bombers, missiles, uh, submarines, all of which are capable of delivering nuclear weapons against uh, various sorts of targets. That brings me to well, we, well, I began with this presentation, Donald Trump. It seems like he was off kilter when he said, let it be an arms race. That, uh, yes, the Russians may be modernizing their nuclear weapons arsenal. Yes, the Chinese are more or less doing the same. We should be doing it ourselves. But he's more or less articulating a long-established tradition in American strategic thought that goes back at least through the 1940s when the United States first developed nuclear weapons and was concerned about the Soviet Union developing its own arsenal uh, back then, to say nothing of the arms race that ensued after uh, the launching of Sputnik in 56-57. And indeed, you get the sense that this arms race that has unfolded is new. This is a figure that was quite popular, sort of, uh, saw a lot of uh, play on social media when it was first released in the Nuclear Posture Review of last year. Every administration since the Cold War issues a document that more or less summarizes their administration's approach or policy towards nuclear weapons. And one of the arguments of the new, new Nuclear Posture Review is that the United States let its capabilities atrophy, whereas competitors or adversaries like Russia, China and North Korea have all introduced new nuclear delivery systems since 2010. It seems rather pathetic that the United States has only introduced one system, whereas 
all of its competitors are introducing a broad suite of various nuclear capabilities. It might seem that Trump is unusual in terms of trying to reinvigorate America's uh, uh, role in this arms race. However, as some uh, nuclear scientists and other strategic thinkers have pointed out, as a matter of fact, even, th even throughout the Obama administration, and I say even because, as you may know, President uh, Barack Obama was very forceful about how there should be global zero and how the United States should be reducing its nuclear weapons stockpile and so forth. Even, th even though there was all of that talk, the United States was introducing nuclear delivery systems on the ground and at sea, in addition to some uh, in the air. So I don't mean to be blithe about uh, the Trump administration and its thinking about nuclear weapons. It's certainly more hawkish uh, than its predecessor, but it's not necessarily abnormal either when you compare it or, or consider it alongside other presidential administrations, at least since Truman, or more specifically since Eisenhower's um, presidency in the 1950s. The United States loves a good arms race, in part because it does them well. It has the most sufficient or sophisticated technology, and it seems that in the 1980s at least, when it made all sorts of investments in counterforce and missile defense, it bankrupted the Soviet Union, and that helped bring about the end of the Cold War. This is, you know, what the, uh, this is a game that the United States loves to play. But it's not just the United States. Russia thinks more or less the same way. So to consider the doomsday clock, I'm a little skeptical as to whether we really are two minutes um, before midnight, uh, despite what uh, the Bolton of the Atomic Scientists say. Certainly, they have other factors that uh, go into their assessment, and those are factors that my colleagues will uh, discuss in their own presentations. But when we consider the nuclear dimension, at least, which was indeed uh, the reason uh, for which uh, the doomsday clock first appeared, it seems like it's more of the same. And if anything, the 1990s and the early 2000s was the weird exception in our history. And on that note, I'd like to uh, turn it over to my colleagues. Thank you, Alexander. Our next speaker is Professor Andy McMurray from the University of Waterloo. He, Andy is a professor of English literature whose areas of expertise includes environmental rhetoric and literature and eco-criticism. In 2018, he published a book of essays entitled Entertaining Futility, Despair and Hope in the Time of Climate Change. Andy. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks uh, to Dean Pierce for inviting me to this beautiful venue uh, to speak of some ugly matters. Uh, now, I assume you've all come here this evening prepared to listen to some preliminary negativity, but with the expectation that you'll be sent home on a positive note. As the recent doomsday statement says, it is two minutes to midnight, but there is no reason the doomsday clock cannot move away from catastrophe. So you'll be wanting to hear from me with respect to climate change how we're going to turn back that clock, but I can't do that. Instead, I'll be telling you that this clock will be threatening midnight for years and years to come. And worse, I'll be telling you that your very assumption that the clock can be rewound is a big part of the problem. My starting premise tonight is that the kind of world you've long enjoyed is ending. We can't know the details, but the broad outlines are coming into focus. Earth will become a hotter, harsher, crueler place. The intricate webs of life, the great Earth systems that move air, water, and matter around the globe, the delicate bonds of civility that tie people and nations together, all will begin to fray. Disequilibrium, panic, hard times. But I don't set out tonight to convince anyone. There's ample evidence available for those with the courage to face it. Instead, I'll describe three types of problems that contribute to our puzzling, maddening inability to do very much about this unfolding catastrophe. A wicked problem is one so complex and multifaceted, so slippery and shifting that simple solutions don't present themselves. It's often the case with wicked problems that the possible solutions will actually create further problems. Climate change most definitely falls into this category. 
The physics of climate change have been known for a very long time. Humankind's introduction into the atmosphere of excess heat trapping gases, primarily carbon dioxide, caused the following. Polar and ice melting, uh, sea level rise, ocean acidification, uh, drought and flood, forest die off, uh, permafrost melting. Uh, may not have any slides here to accompany this talk, but that, that's not the end of the world. Yeah. Uh, I'll just carry on. Uh, so changes in ocean and air currents, uh, expansion uh, of the range of malaria, contraction of the range of staple crops, coral reef die-off, species extinction. I could spend the rest of my night uh, adding to the list. And uh, each of these problems ripple out to cause new ones. The cascading effects and the prospect of ones we can't yet predict terrify the scientists who are studying them. Now, reducing greenhouse gases is impossible without a massive, immediate, and unfortunately highly improbable transformation of human society. It seems that everything we do to run our globe-girdling industrial civilization generates these gases. Energy production and consumption, building, transportation, agriculture, cattle ranching, cement manufacturing, mining, forestry, flying, driving, heating, cooling, lawn care, pet care, child care, elder care. Disposable diapers, disposable cups, Canadians' passion for Tim Horton's coffee, American passion for hamburgers. Some people believe that the function of civilization is to enhance human life and eliminate suffering, but it's looking more and more that all along, civilization's true purpose has been to release locked up carbon and thicken the planet's atmosphere, and in the process, make worse every other environmental problem we already had. Now, in the back of your mind, you're thinking, well, you know, something will come along to fix this, right? We're pretty good at solving technical problems after all. Isn't climate change just a matter of throwing up millions of windmills and solar panels and switching to electric cars and drawing out the excess carbon we put into the atmosphere or geoengineering our way out of the carbon crunch? Isn't this what humans are best at, putting our collective heads together to eradicate common enemies, war, pestilence, plague, and so on? And by the way, can't we get used to hotter summers and green Christmases? Can't we build better air conditioners and enjoy uh, snow-free winters? Haven't we always been able to adapt to new realities? Isn't climate change just another temporary problem that will be crushed under the wheels of our tremendous technological fix-it machine? Well, uh, you can think that if you like, but the truth is we're talking about climate change drivers that gain potency every day and adverse effects now beginning to feed on themselves and shift into vicious runaway cycles. We've already blown through the safety margins and our production of greenhouse gases is not abating but increasing. Our feeble attempts to halt climate catastrophe are like the efforts of a lifelong chain smoker who at age 60 decides to improve his health, he's going to eat kale twice a week. So, if climate change is a wicked technical problem, we have perhaps the even wickeder problem of convincing people we are already in a planetary emergency. Let's call this wickeder problem the problem of climate change communication. The landmark testimony of James Hansen in 1988, the five international panel on climate change assessments, the Kyoto Protocol of 1992, the Copenhagen Accord of 2009, the Paris Agreement of 2015, the films of Al Gore, the TV series hosted by Leonardo DiCaprio, Meryl Streep, Harrison Ford, Arnold Schwarzenegger, you name the celebrity, the ongoing warnings from climate scientists, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Bill Nye the science guy, the drumbeat of climate warnings in the news, all this information was meant to motivate citizens and their political representatives to get busy and head off the worst consequences of climate change before it was locked in. Why have these warnings failed to achieve their purpose? Why has climate change communication never penetrated deeply enough to drive policy agendas? Why does climate change as an election issue always pull behind the economy, healthcare, unemployment, immigration, crime, and a host of other issues? Why? when climate change stands to make all those other issues much, much worse. Well, the first communication challenge may be the name climate change itself. Climate change is what we call a weasel phrase. It was thrust into the popular lexicon through the efforts of Republican pollster Frank Luntz, who, while working for the climate-skeptical George W. Bush administration, aimed to push the discourse from scary global warming to a more benign-sounding moniker. Climate change. Seems relatively neutral. Could go up, could go down, who knows, might be a wash. Indeed, uh, during the Harper years, a national roundtable was struck under the auspices of climate prosperity. 
The panel's reports, yeah, were uh, to explore the challenges and opportunities that climate change presented with the implication that Canada, as a northern nation, might on the whole do well under a warmer climate regime. Now, language is important, and whatever we name something helps us orient ourselves toward it. And perhaps climate destabilization or climate chaos or even global weirding would have been better motivators. But that ship has sailed. Second, we have the challenge of climate skeptics and outright deniers who send the wrong message. Here's Senator James Inhofe, arch denier, displaying powerful evidence in 2015 <laughs> until 2016, the hottest year on record, that global warming is a scam perpetrated by grant-seeking climate scientists and hordes of liberal freedom haters. And here we have another denier who claims <laughs> global warming famously is a Chinese hoax meant to undermine American commercial dominance. Now, Trump finds many ways to insult reality and enrage those with a stake in it, but standing with him are the gas, coal, and oil companies and other purveyors of greenhouse gases who, like the tobacco companies before them, have invested heavily in disinformation and untruth. In fact, Exxon had the science 40 years ago that showed the threat their products posed. That's why they built their oil platforms with extra clearance to handle sea level rise. They sowed confusion through the media and donated to pro-oil think tanks and other propaganda chop houses that worked uh, tirelessly to cast doubt on the science. Today, that skepticism is official policy in the Republican Party in the United States, as well as the standard messaging of many conservative politicians in Canada, like Doug Ford, who say, sure, climate change is real, but there's not a whole lot we're going to do about it because it cuts into corporate profits. A third communication challenge is that for most people, the story of climate change is kind of boring. Its plot is tedious and its characters are flat and wooden. It's like watching 17 hours of the Fireplace Channel or the proceedings of the Ontario Legislative Assembly. It can't compete with the latest scandal in Hollywood or the news of another royal baby. In 2017, there were 260 minutes of climate change coverage on the four major American TV networks. Of that, 205 minutes were about climate change only in connection to the Trump administration. By contrast, Trump-related news probably amasses 260 minutes per day. Conclusion, BS sells, climate change doesn't. Along these lines, while folks like to chat about the weather, consequential discussion of climate is a different matter. Everybody understands that in North America we have warm climates like Florida and cold climates like Baffin Island and everything in between. But all the other phenomena associated with climate are harder to comprehend. You, you notice the uh, increase in overwintering bird populations. She observes the earlier frost-free days affect her planning schedule in the garden. And I pay attention to an uptick in pollen counts because I'm an allergy sufferer. But few of us notice the plummeting insect populations, the failure of Great Lakes ice cover to form, the creeping range of the opossum and the phragmite, an invasive water reed. Evidence of climate change settles into the background and the abnormal becomes the new normal. Bizarre, once in a hundred or thousand year weather events are now part of the routine. Even when those events hit closer to home, a drought that raises the price of lettuce, the bankruptcy of a local ski hill, these two are quickly absorbed in the common experience and we move on. A friend of yours quips about a recent cold snap, boy, we sure could use some of that global warming right now, which while predictable and not very funny, also reveals our personal focus when it comes to weather. The slosh of cold Arctic air here in southern Ontario is a result of an unsettled jet stream, which is unsettled precisely because of the broad warming trend in the high latitudes of the globe over the summer. The collapse of the polar vortex is not evidence of global cooling, but an outcome of climate instability. Well, try telling that to your Uncle Joe. He just wants to know if he should wear a warmer hat on his way to the coffee shop. Fourth, communication about climate change comes up, comes up uh, against a range of psychological factors that cause us to tune out alarming news or to discount it or to place it in a larger category of, hmm, that's interesting. We've not evolved to act on certain kinds of risks. We're superb at fearing sharks, lions, other humans with weapons, heights, confined spaces. We move quickly uh, indoors when it's raining or outdoors when a fire alarm sounds. But in so many ways, we just don't perceive the subtler cues the world gives us. We're deaf to slow-moving catastrophes and blind to dangers distance, distant in time and space. We're like teenagers confronted with vapes or greasy food. The rewards are immediate, the risks far off in the future. We'll let our older selves handle them. Now, one psychological factor has been dubbed 
the cultural cognition of risk, which even high-functioning, well-informed, scientifically literate folks like you all routinely fall prey to. It, work, it works like this. Let's say you have a long-standing belief in the value of unfettered free markets because you think these contribute to the betterment of society. If you were to be given solid evidence that unfettered free markets actually produce greater environmental risks, cultural cognition theory would predict that rather than embracing this evidence and shifting your values, your instinct would be to rationalize it or explain it away. As Senator Inhofe, the snowball-toting senator, said a number of years ago to Rachel Maddow, quote, I was actually on your side of this issue when I first heard about this global warming. I thought it must be true until I found out what it cost, unquote. Actual quote, most often these values are held so dearly not for intellectual reasons, but for social ones. Let's say you belong to a group of friends and family who are all convinced that climate change is a left-wing fraud. What's the benefit of you disagreeing with them? It's easier and more comfortable to maintain your status and solidarity with your group than to espouse beliefs that create friction. And it's not just that you secretly believe in climate change and pretend otherwise. Cultural cognition actually means you've already been socially indoctrinated into the values and worldview that preclude believing in dangerous climate change. And you hold up your denialism proudly. Now, the last problem I want to discuss has been the focus of my own research. It's a rhetorical problem, or what you might think of as a problem of persuasion. I'm going to flatter myself in my area of study by calling it the wickedest problem of all. And here's a book. We don't have it at the KPL. You should agitate to get it. Uh, the, the wickedest problem starts with the realization that it's very hard to persuade folks of something when not only their own paychecks, but their whole way of life, all their hopes and dreams for themselves and their children, depend very much on them not being persuaded, on them maintaining instead a kind of willful ignorance, a deep-seated and almost impenetrable resistance to unpleasant realities. And it's doubly hard to persuade those folks out of that denialism when in actual fact they have throughout their entire lives, in a million different ways, subtle and unsubtle, been persuaded in exactly the opposite direction, towards believing in fantasies like the inevitability of human progress, in our endless capacity to solve insoluble problems, and in our species' durability and cosmic centrality. In short, our whole culture and its messaging and its stories and its preferred self-descriptions works tirelessly to persuade us that climate change is not something we really need to fear. Someone once claimed that the greatest challenge in life is to conduct ourselves gracefully while under a death sentence. That is to say, each day we get up in the morning, put on our clothes, have breakfast, pet the cat, and set aside the awareness of our eventual deaths. We go about our normal routines with the fatal rendezvous safely out of sight and out of mind. It's a strange evolutionary advance when you think about it, but surely a necessary one. Humans are smart enough, self-reflective enough to know with some accuracy their expiry dates. For example, the average lifespan in Canada is 82. Why don't each of you now calculate how many years you likely have left? Yet that grim knowledge does not damn us to perpetual angst and misery. No, we're able to set aside the awful truth that nobody gets out of life alive. And culture helps. In fact, ours is a culture that touts a kind of proxy immortality. We have religions, creeds, songs, and stories designed to make a silk purse out of this particular sow's ear. We've got afterlifes to suit your taste, immortal gods and immortal souls. We've got the solace of knowing that at least some part of us continues on in our children. At the societal level, we reaffirm this strange idea that the human project is permanent, enduring, inextinguishable, that our civilization will go on and on, likely only to grow in power and scope as our understanding and technical mastery of the conditions of life increase. There's great comfort in this idea. Our individual works and days become attached to this grand narrative. And we come to believe that even though we may pass on, the magnificent human pageant will soldier on. All previous civilizations imagined they too were death-proof. In some respects, their greatest achievements were nothing but monuments to that arrogant belief. Whether the de decline and collapse took place over centuries or happened virtually overnight, we often find that the seeds of the collapse were contained in their irresponsible use of natural resources and untenable relationships to their environments. Our own civilization continues to dream of its prosperous future, even as Earth sends out harsh rebukes in the form of storm and flood and drought and fire. Beneath the bright, shiny buildings and magnificent roadways that tout an unending future of progress and consumption, 
the rotten pilings of our grand necropolis sink ever deeper into the black sucking mire. And each of us is fully invested in the fallacy that our world will go on and on. There's not much profit in thinking otherwise. I like to use this famous painting by Winslow Homer to visualize our attitude. Here you see the shipwrecked man threatened on all sides by peril, his situation dire. Sharks in the foreground, water spouts, an unseeing ship in the background. But wait a minute. The man seems rather stoic, looking off the painting in the only direction not full of despair. Is that the direction of hope? Does salvation lie out that way? I think our civilization is a little like that, man, looking into the as yet unknowable, unseeable future and imagining something out there will rescue us. Now, at least for this man who seems in an altogether hopeless bind, maybe the unknown, the as yet to be, can and should provide some comfort. But for us, faced with the looming environmental catastrophe everywhere we turn, well, as Mark Wahlberg said wisely in the great movie Deepwater Horizon, hope ain't a tactic. <laughs> to have faith that unseen forces will save us is the very definition of magical thinking. More than hope, perhaps what we need now is a powerful and bracing fear. So the clock is set at two minutes to midnight. Maybe on the way out of the library, if it's still open, tonight you'll pick up the latest novel by James Patterson or Louise Penny or sign out a romantic comedy or superhero DVD. Do me a favor. After you've read the book or viewed the film, take a moment to think about how that story represents just another entry in a much grander narrative. When the spy foils the terrorist or the detective solves the case or the superhero vanquishes the supervillain or the boy wins the girl and they live happily ever after, keep in mind that once again you're being trained to believe in the endless triumph of humans over their challenges. You're being taught that there's always hope, that after the war comes the peace, that after the disaster comes the rebuilding, that beyond climate change is the awaiting utopia. But I'd like you to try instead to consider a future without a rewound doomsday clock, without an assumption that something will come along to save us, without even a guarantee that the future will actually arrive, then I'd like you to ponder the significance of the words spoken by the great Catalonian cellist Pablo Casals during another very tar dark time in Spanish history. The situation is hopeless. We must take the next step. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Our final speaker tonight is Professor Kate Henney, who's Professor of Sociology and Legal Studies at the University of Waterloo, where she holds a Canada Research Chair in Biogovernance, Law and Society. Her research includes governance of populations and individual humans through science and technology. Kate. Let me do a check check. Can everyone hear me? All right, let me make sure I've got this on. All right. There we go. So I should probably warn you all while I get started and set up here that I'm going to probably be continuing the theme of doom and gloom. Probably not as doom and gloom as the last one. Um, <laughs> can't compete with that one. Um, but I do want to add a bit of critical hope about, in terms of how we approach the challenges associated with disruptive technologies. So to do so, my talk tonight is going to focus on two main parts. And that first part is, you know, what does the Doomsday Clock Report actually say about threats posed um, by disruptive technologies? And then second, I'm going to highlight some emergent research, including some work we're doing at the university, and how that might offer some alternative perspectives that I think are worth discussing. So let's kick off. How does the Doomsday Clock Report talk about these threats posed by disruptive technology? Well, it's primarily concerned with information warfare, and let me define that for you, because I actually wasn't quite sure what that was, personally. And so it defines it as the country, various countries' use of propaganda to advance their own interests, using the dissemination of information to manipulate human predispositions in ways that can exacerbate our prejudices, our biases, and our fundamental ideological differences. So thanks to the internet and social media networks, according to the report, the volume and velocity of information has increased significantly, and these developments in turn, come on, 
have created chaos within our information networks, undermining the credibility and availability of accurate, reliable information, which they argue is absolutely essential if we're going to have fair and strong governance. So the report goes on to say that we are seeing established institutions such as the government, journalism, and education as under attack precisely because they provided instability in the past. And while I really wanted to put up a slide of Donald J. Trump, I decided to control myself. Um, so thank you other speakers for doing so. So in addition, the doomsday clock does draw attention to other kinds of potential threats from technology, because certainly it can't just be information warfare that, that is the concern, but it does so to a lesser extent. So in particular, it highlights concerns around artificial intelligence, which I'll call AI for the rest of the presentation, new biotechnologies, the Internet of Things, which is a term used to capture a growing reliance on computerized devices. So just to illustrate, software not only supports our mobile phones. In fact, how many people have a computer as their mobile phone, like an iPhone? Almost everyone. Who's the Luddites in the room? You're my idols. <laughs> So anyway, it's not just our phones, it's our TVs, it's our cars, it's our appliances, it's our homes, it's our transport systems, our infrastructure, everything that affects our everyday life. So the specific threats identified in the report are the following in relation to these other technologies. The prospect of designer humans in light of controversies around the human genome editing that happened in China last year, got a little bit of media attention, don't know if you caught it. The fact that AI might result in weapons, robots, and vehicles that may make decisions to kill without human supervision, and concerns that sabotaging our internet-enabled networks that we rely on for major infrastructure will actually threaten our foundational security. So disrupting those networks could wreak havoc on society. So while these concerns are noteworthy, the report and its focus on this new abnormal is unattainable downplay some key issues about disruptive technologies, including the fact that they do permeate our everyday life, and that they also regulate our lives in many ways that we don't even know or realize. So they're disrupting our lives every day that we don't even realize it. So in short, I want to talk about how there's many more disruptions that are risks than the threats identified in the report. And what I'll try to illustrate here is that they pose significant dangers that our most vulnerable in society are already experiencing. We just don't always realize it. So before I get there, I want to use a little bit of a more mundane example to kind of illustrate what I mean by disruption in everyday life. So think about it when you're driving in Toronto. And I've only lived in Canada for three years and I already avoid the 401 and driving in Toronto. Or you can think about when you're on the 401 and there's a traffic congestion or there's an accident or construction. I know I do this and I'm sure many others do. We look at our Google or Apple Maps app or a specialized app like Waze for advice on where to, how to get to our destination. And in fact, one of the things that I thought was amazing driving on the 401, not only the fact that it has a TV show, but actually driving it, um, is that I actually would see droves of cars getting off and congesting smaller roadways just to avoid the prospect of a red line that they're seeing on their app, right? Our whole behavior changes because of what we see on, on this, this device. So while there may not be an evident threat in that particular example, if we look at some emergent changes on the horizon with our social messaging applications, we can start to see some that might become a little bit more visible. So for example, how many people are on Facebook? How many people use Messenger or WhatsApp? Instagram, Instafans? Oh, fewer, okay. Well, so Facebook recently announced that it plans to integrate these messaging services, which all do different things, in one integrated suite. So you can use them in the different apps. So they're going to try to blend these together. Now, critics have raised a lot of concerns about this proposal, in part because Facebook doesn't exactly have the best reputation at the moment, and for a variety of good reasons, right? It's exploitation of customers, it's failure to regulate information warfare, it's potential impact of that on the 2016 election and various other elections in different countries beyond the United States, and it's failure to regulate so-called trolls, so people and bots that go out and harass others, right? It's, not, it's got a bad track record and, and its stocks haven't been done as well um, as a result. 
In fact, one of those critics is our own prime minister, who just last Friday actually criticized Facebook and other tech companies for, quote, generating hefty profits while failing to support traditional news operations in Canada, which he framed just like the doomsday report as central to a robust democracy. So without calling out Facebook, he's suggesting that it's undermining the institutions that make our democracy work. So others, such as the Open Privacy Research Society, and I encourage everyone to look out for their information because they're a great nonprofit in Canada, plus we've got some PhDs and PhD graduates from Waterloo on the board, so gotta give them props. Um, they've expressed really targeted concerns about this messenger merger, for lack of a better word. And they're arguing that it would become uh, more than a massive communication network. It would actually be a massive surveillance network, harvesting a lot of data about users and their relationships that we don't even realize. So Facebook would not just be monetizing and tracking our social relationships and group, but it also could make that data available to other entities, such as law enforcement or other private companies, without users' knowledge. In fact, how many people actually read their terms of service when, they, when it gets an update? That's what I thought. I don't either. So while national security's concerns, right, tend to come up when we talk about law enforcement, and that seems completely understandable, research by Professor Natasha Tuzikov, who's based at York, shows that if we empower telecons in this way, it's actually led them to doing various actions against users that exceed security concerns. So including issuing threats of taking down online contact, even when that content doesn't violate copyright rules. So we actually see them going beyond the terms of the agreement or the discourse of security to do other kinds of activities. And the danger she suggests is that these actions are done without any kinds of checks and balances or any clear appeals processes. So with these issues in mind, the folks at the Open Privacy Research Society really emphasize that we already know Facebook does not provide a secure space. And they really emphasize that if we look at marginalized groups' experiences online, we know that's particularly the case, because they experience a lot of harassment, their groups often get closed down. So why on earth would we trust them with the largest global communication network? We can ask that question, but we actually don't have any mechanisms to prevent it in many cases. So ongoing research actually supports their concerns, and it does so in relation to various technical systems. So I'm just going to talk about a few here that focus on our growing reliance on algorithms and decision-making processes. And they cross a variety of ranges, from security and policing, to child protection, to social assistance delivery. So for example, very recently, US Congresswoman uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez recently stated in a public interview that facial recognition technologies perpetuate racial discrimination. You know, we see this all the time in policing tactics, airports, various other things. And critics argued that she was wrong because these technologies rely on, and this is their language, not mine, objective math equations. So, how... Despite that criticism and our belief in math as something that might be objective and true, and again, I'm not very good at math, so I really can't, you know, I won't go there. We do have compelling evidence that even if the math is right, human assumptions and biases can become built into these technological assessment processes, and they're certainly not limited to facial recognition. So I'm just gonna highlight two pieces of research here. The first of which is by Sophia Noble, who's a professor at UCLA, and her research shows that online search engine results actually reinforce harmful racist and sexist stereotypes. She says you can all Google black women right now, and the first options you get will be all negative. If you enter in white women, something very different will pop up. And actually in doing so, they limit our access to more balanced forms of information. So we look to the information to get more information, but the algorithms are actually channeling what we get. Virginia Eubanks has carried out a, a, quite a few in-depth studies on the effects of incorporating high-tech tools in the delivery of social assistance. And I'm particularly interested in this because this is an area I work in. And so her findings show that the use of technology to monitor welfare recipients' behavior often leads to significant harm when those technologies are supposed to make the experience better, more accountable, and more fair. 
So specifically, she's traced a number of cases where people have been denied necessary benefits due to quote unquote abnormalities found in the data. So for instance, a red flag can appear in a technical system that a social worker is looking at for a number of reasons. In cases where, say, for example, someone cannot submit information by a deadline due to circumstances under, not, that are beyond their control, they have another obligation, something creeps up. But because these processes are increasingly automated, there's no opportunity to easily change or remove that red flag or the outcomes that it results in. So more generally, she argues that these technologies, because they're hard to reverse, because they become embedded in the system, actually are contributing to something that she calls digital poorhouses. They're surrounding us as we sit here and we don't see them. And she says that's because poor people tend to be subjected to more forms of surveillance in an involuntary way. It's not like they're actively participating in this. I mean, they are actively participating, but they don't have a say in the process and de more data collection than other citizens. So their data is more likely to be shared by different kinds of authorities and groups, hindering their ability to access services, or it makes them more vulnerable to predatory advertising or other kinds of predatory company scams. So rather than being confined in physical poor houses, they're becoming ensnared by fiber optic threads that they can't see, but they can certainly feel. So arguably, even though we're occupying similar spaces, we're having very different experiences because of our engagement with these systems. So our ongoing research at Waterloo points to other areas confirm, concern, and I, I just want to highlight a few of them. So one of our projects looks at the wider push across multiple countries um, to use digital identity verification. Um, such as the use of fingerprints or iris scans as a way of ensuring social assistance recipients get their benefits. So the stated reasons for this trend is often to prevent fraud or to like create cost savings to by eliminating paperwork. So India, a place where many people lack formal identification documents, has really pioneered these systems and it seems to make sense, right? We have a lot of people that live below the poverty line and they need social benefits, but they don't have identification. We want to make sure they're the ones who get it. So they've actually created a system, the Ad Heart program, which relies on a database of over 1.2 billion identifiers now. So it was originally proposed as a voluntary program in 2010, um, but it's actually become a precondition for applying to access multiple services now, such as setting up a mobile phone, setting up a bank account, obtaining educational loans and grants, and even to file taxes. So even though it's supposed to be voluntary, in many ways it's mandatory to get these services. And with its expansion, investigative journalists and researchers have documented many cases of incorrectly denied benefits, major data breaches, information being inappropriately used and sold, and even disenfranchisement of minority groups because the system's identifiers don't align correctly. Even though that was obviously not the intention. In light of these developments, we've decided to develop some projects closer to home one of which extends studies around surveillance in the criminal justice system and in law enforcement, and in the other one in the context of immigration. So scholars have already documented the expanded use of tracking persons who have been released from jail or prison, and the use of technology for assessing and predicting the likelihood of future offending. And I don't want to blow up for you, but the results are really mixed, that we've invested a lot in technology and the results aren't actually as efficient um, as they promise. So actually a common finding has been called the rise of e-carceration. So we're not locking people up, though we are doing a lot of that, is that we're actually tracking them outside of prisons, similar to the digital poorhouses phenomenon. So even if someone has served time for a crime or been identified as at risk to do a crime, they endure significant monitoring. And if they don't comply with those requirements, it increases their chances of violating them, their terms and being incarcerated. So a project led by one of our PhD candidates, um, Crystal Shore, actually looks at how these systems have gone farther to track citizens in Ontario, actually, with cognitive conditions, so such as people with dementia, um, severe forms of autism, for example. And that 
they've been putting tracking devices on these um, groups of people to make sure they don't wander. So it's pitched as a way to help caregivers and is increasingly used by, in, by police in Ontario, but we don't actually know what happens or how it's being used. So we want to get a better sense of whether or not and how they're working, what's happening with the data, who's it being used by, is it actually delivering a safer um, and more secure place. Another one of our projects by um, PhD student Jenna Harb is looking at the UN's new program which biometrically verifies refugees in the same way that the India system works. So we want to know what policymakers think is happening as a result of the system and what the actual experiences are on the ground and how that data is being used and shared. So taken together, our hope with these projects is to shed light on possible vulnerabilities and trade-offs that may disproportionately harm members of marginalized groups. So let's get back to the big picture. One of the big pictures is scholars have argued that this is a wider shift called techno-governance. So while there are clear benefits to technology, there are growing concerns about its impact, particularly around automation and algorithms and AI, as they can take away human decision-making in cases where discretion is really necessary or be used to undermine wider democratic processes. So I'm going to start wrapping things up with a short reflection about what we can do and then pose some questions around regulation. And I know regulation makes everyone's eyes glaze over, but it's something I think we have to talk about a little bit probably during Q&A and not by me um, in this space. So we see some clear challenges underpinning the examples I've discussed. So in many of them, we see corporations having a major say in how these systems operate often without any clear checks or balances or any consultation with the groups who are most impacted by them. Second, the, the ways they're shaping our everyday activities are rarely visible. And even if they are, many of us don't understand the possible ramifications of using technological services or we don't have accessible alternatives. And many of the services that we think of public goods or as necessary to everyday life are actually being delivered by companies who are looking to find and maximize profit. So in turn, that may incentivize the convenience of technology so people use it, but it also like, disincentivizes widespread consultation or the consideration of disempowered groups' needs. So can we develop something responsive? We can at least, now that we've thought through some of these examples, start to ask some critical questions about that. I won't get into what the scholars are doing, that would be a whole other topic. Um, but I hope in highlighting some of these examples, we can think critically about technology, even its well-intended use, and how it doesn't just contribute to advancement. Right? Some of those narratives that Andy just talked about. Technology doesn't always advance, it can actually exacerbate inequality. So, let's just rewrap up what this does versus what the doomsday clock says. So first, it sheds light on a wider scope of threats and risks, um, many of which hit home closer than those articulated in the report. Second, it helps us and reminds us that we need to think through different kinds of inequality, such as race, ethnicity, gender, disability, and sexuality, in addition to socioeconomic status, when we start thinking about technology, which are noticeably absent from the report. One thing that my talk is limited by and the report is that we're still talking about the human-centric version of this, right? We're not thinking through the effects of disruptive technologies um, in relation to the other organisms that we cohabit this world with, with. So for example, I haven't even touched on the waste generated by these products or our not only our reliance on them, but planned obsolescence so that we buy more, right? That capitalistic drive is embedded in it and the continued cycles of human and non-human exploitation that come with our reliance on these technologies. And so while this perspective is probably not exactly positive, my hope is that we've pointed to some concrete things that we can start to think about and respond to either in our everyday life as citizens, as groups of community members, or even in appealing to our governments. So thank you.